On July 1, 2025, astronomers detected the third interstellar visitor to our solar system. Right now, that mysterious object, 3i ATLS, is threading this asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, its speed rising as the Sun pulls it closer. By late October 2025, it's expected to peak at roughly 1,52,000 miles per hour, about 68 kilometers per second, a velocity that will fling it back into the dark once its sun skimming arc is done. All of that is normal for an interstellar traveler. What isn't normal is everything else. From the moment 3i ATLS appeared, it refused to behave like a standard comet. Its early glow looked less like a dusty halo and more like light coming straight off the surface. A red-tinged glint some interpreted as self-lit, others as an unusual reflectivity from a thin, iron-poor dust layer. Then the color shifted. The object changed from reddish to green as it neared Mars. And the brightness didn't follow a smooth, predictable curve. Instead, it jumped. An abrupt surge from magnitude 18 to magnitude 12 and smaller bursts since, like someone turned a dimmer switch, paused and turned it again. Green comae are usually easy to explain. Sunlight hits diatomic carbon, electrons jump and fall, and a distinctive jade light spills out. But in this case, the familiar culprit isn't showing up. Spectra from multiple instruments reveal almost no C2 at all. JWST data point to a different cocktail. Unusually high carbon dioxide, traces of cyanogen, and a metal fingerprint with loud nickel and oddly quiet iron. None of that combination naturally screams bright emerald. Yet the green intensifies. The molecule we expect is missing. The glow persists. That contradiction has opened the door to two families of explanations. The cautious virgin says we are seeing new chemistry. A molecule forged in harsh interstellar radiation, unfamiliar to our local comets, now fluorescing in the sun's light. Another argues that nickel may be woven into fragile metal organic lattices that fracture under ultraviolet bombardment, spewing radicals that glow green without C2. Both are exotic, both are testable. Then there is the bold whisper, the glow could be powered. Not an accident of sunlight, but a managed emission. No one should leap there without overwhelming evidence. But when colour and chemistry refuse to agree, people ask harder questions. There is a simpler reason for some of the brightness, outbursts. As 3i ATLS warms, more volatile ices can vent rapidly, blasting gas and dust off the surface. That makes comets flare almost overnight. We've seen it before. And when internal pressure gets too high, fragile nuclei can split. Shoemaker Levy 9 broke into a train of pieces before plunging into Jupiter. Fragmentation alone could explain some bursts. What makes researchers uneasy is the timing and the pattern. Red to green near Mars, then pulses inside the belt in a sequence that looks more like steps than stumbles. This is where Avi Loeb, Harvard, entered the chat with a sharp hypothesis. 3i ATLS might be a spacecraft disguised as a comet capable of shedding probes while passing through. He even floated the idea that the sudden appearance of C-2015 F2 Swan could have been a fragment or scout released by 3i ATLS as it approached Mars. Follow-up work shot down that specific link. Swan came from the opposite side of the sky. But the broader warning stood. Don't assume this visitor is ordinary as it swings by Mars in early October. Leave room for unnatural behaviour. The sky it came from adds a layer of folklore. 3i ATLS approaches from Sagittarius, near the galactic centre, the same broad region where strange radio events have surfaced for decades, including the famous WOW signal. Alignment is not identity, space is an ocean of coincidences, but the conjunction of direction, chemistry and timing makes people prick up their ears. The path through a system doesn't calm anyone down. Instead of diving in at a random tilt like most interstellar objects, 3i ATLS runs almost parallel to the ecliptic the solar system's main highway. Its orbital plane sits within a few degrees of ours. Along the way, it makes relatively close passes by multiple planets, then slips behind the Sun at perihelion from Earth's point of view, effectively hiding during the most active phase. It never comes especially close to Earth. If this were a craft masquerading as a comet, that blackout would be the moment to change speed, alter course or release secondaries. The glare would cover the moves, and the Sun would offer energy for any refueling we don't know how to see. It's fair to ask, why now? Before 2017, we never confirmed a single interstellar object. In less than a decade, we've seen three, Oumuamua, 2i Borisov, and now 3i ATLS. Maybe these visitors have always passed through and our instruments finally grew precise enough to catch them? Maybe there's a trigger. The past century of radio, radar, and satellite noise from Earth 
has watched over dozens of nearby stars. If anyone was listening, a quiet audit wouldn't be a ridiculous response. A comparison with Uma more complicates the story. When researchers compared 3i ATLS electromagnetic emissions to archival data from Oumuamua, they reported a brief match at a specific 47 frequency in Oumuamua's faint tail amplified and prolonged in 3i ATLS. Oumuamua baffled us with its shape, tumble and acceleration that didn't match gravitational models. We argued about outgassing we couldn't see was his sunlight pressure on a thin sheet. If Oumuamua was a passive recon pass and 3i ATLS's active engagement, it's the difference between a pilot wave and a program. That impression hardened when telescopes in Chile and Hawaii recorded a small surgical coast change in 3i ATLS, something mainstream perturbations couldn't supply, not drift, a decision. More unsettling, the timing matched JWST acquiring an optimal lock. Correlation is not causation, but when you see a deliberate vector change land precisely when you point your best eyes, it doesn't feel like wind. The strangest claim lives in the math. Cryptographers and signal analysts working with 3i ATLS's pulses have reported embedded structures, golden ratio, Fibonacci steps, prime sequences, spirals, mathematical constants that echo across biology, galaxy arms and human architecture alike. Those aren't secret codes, they are the shapes the universe likes to draw. But here they appear in modulated signals that change with solar activity, planetary proximity and even Earth's radio noise, like a system sampling its environment and responding. Most chilling was a brief, precise disruption in the pulse strain that matched the exact moment JWST locked on in infrared. It looked like awareness rendered in math. JWST's chemistry added fuel to the fire. Infrared spectra revealed polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, complex carbon molecules on the outer shell. PAHs are common in space, but here they appeared unusually pure and organized. On Earth, PAHs are precursors in prebiotic chemistry, steps toward amino acids, RNA structures, and life. To find them apparently well-ordered after a journey through interstellar radiation fields raises two possibilities. Unknown natural processes refine them or they are preserved in arranged by design. That's how seed ship ideas creep into the room. Not a war machine, but a planter, scattering life's templates where conditions allow. Then a signal came from our own sky. A classified high-altitude balloon over Antarctica recorded a sharp microwave burst centered above the South Pole. Minutes later, seismic stations across the ice registered ultra-low frequency rumbles with no tectonic cause. The frequencies matched 3i ATLS's space-based pulses. Synchronization across space and Earth is hard to file under coincidence. Some argue the burst was solar interference, other see coordination, an interstellar source tickling terrestrial systems that only respond to specific electromagnetic nudges. Antarctica is geophysically weird, unique crust, deep ice, strange propagation paths. If anything wakes there, it tends to do so loudly. Back in space, 3i ATLS entered the asteroid belt and with it, a marsh of dusty plasma and tangled fields. The asteroid belt is not just rocks, it's a dynamic electromagnetic environment. 3i ATLS's coma is enormous, roughly 700,000 kilometers across, about half the sun's diameter. As it plows through, charged dust and plasma mix with solar wind, strengthening and twisting the interplanetary magnetic field in what some researchers are calling an electromagnetic web effect. Charged dust can surf existing current systems that flow toward the sun. In this view, 3i ATLS isn't just a passenger, it's a battery, briefly rewiring the solar system's neural network. What could that mean for us? In the presence of solar storms, injections of charged dust could enhance geomagnetic effects, changing how auroras dance and how power grids groan. If those dust streams align with Earth's magnetosphere, they could produce anomalies long after the object itself is gone, lingering after images in the interplanetary magnetic field. Most models aren't built to include a half-sun-wide active envelope moving through the belt. Any prediction comes with humility. With each data drop, the narrative gets bolder. Some analysts think we're not seeing a first contact, but an activation. A system that's been waiting, watching a radio shell grow, now switching on. That frame turns glow into broadcast, 
turns course correction into protocol, turns pulses into handshakes. Recently, observers reported a new, lower frequency signal aimed not at Earth but outward, longer pulses directed into deep space. Is it calling something? Reporting? Syncing? The idea that 3i ATLS is a node in a network, not a lone wanderer, stops being fictioned when the pulses keep score. Amid all this, we shouldn't skip the practical near-term risks. The probability of a direct collision with a large asteroid remains small, but electromagnetic and gravitational interactions in the belt could destabilize smaller bodies or create cascades of fragments. Even a modest collision could nudge 3i ATLS's path within error bars we don't like. Modelers are racing time, millions of tracked rocks, billions untracked, and a traveler with properties we haven't seen before. The right answer may be, watch closely and prepare to update. So where does this leave us? With a calendar and a checklist. October 29th, 2025, perihelion. That's when heat flips switches. If the green glow is driven by a new molecule, it should surge or fail it in ways chemistry can predict. If nickel-linked radicals are involved, look for specific shifts in oxygen and carbon bands. If it's something else, its behavior will step to a schedule, not the sun's. Radio arrays will quietly listen in case sunlight pumps a message that math has been hinting at. Mars comes just before and just after that moment. That's a gift. Mars orbiters, MRO, Marvin, ExoMars TGO can do something Earth-bound instruments cannot. Watch from a different angle as 3i ATLS SCOMA sweeps by. If any of them catch repeating pulses or heat patterns that don't map to day-night cycles, the design hypothesis hardens. If the orbit makes a surgical shift, Earth can't explain with gravity, it hardens more. If nothing odd happens, nature gets to keep the chalk and we learn new chemistry without inventing machines. The back half of this story, as unsettling as it is, is also honest wonder. We may be watching a universe teach us in three chapters. Chapter 1. Oumuamua, the quiet enigma, a whisper of possibility. Chapter 2. 3i ATLS, the loud student, writing in color and math, pushing us to admit a rule book was thin. Chapter 3. Whatever answers perihelion and Mars paint in the margins. If all of this turns out to be nature, new molecules, new dust, new plasma dynamics, we grow. If even part of it turns out to be design, embedded math that answers, course corrections that aim, we grow in a different way. Either way, the ending of this act is the sun. Perihelion will compress time, outbursts will spike, tails will tear and reform, spectra will sing or stutter, instruments will ride the edge of saturation. So much so that some defense analysts are already whispering for dawn denial event. The idea that the emerald glare could temporarily blind optical sensors and carve blind spots in the sky. To a photographer, that's a glare. To a strategist, that's a tactic. Natural or not, it's a reminder that our eyes can be fooled by brilliant things. We have only ever confirmed three interstellar visitors. One whispered, one obeyed, one is writing in green. This time we are ready, or as ready as anyone can be for a mystery that bright. Four space telescopes are locked, mass orbiters are tuned, ground arrays are synced. It is a once-in-a-lifetime convergence of rarity and readiness. If this is a comet with chemistry from another nursery, we will learn about ices and dust we've never met. If it is a machine, we will have proof written in vectors in math, not on a plaque. Until then, hold two truths at once. Be open to surprise, be allergic to shortcuts. Let the next answers belong to the sun and to the instruments we've built to read its light on a stranger's skin. Thanks for watching another episode. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more quality content.